Hey everyone, Reflected here, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to operate the F4U Corsair from a carrier following real world procedures. We're gonna have a look at taking off, rendezvous, and recoveries. I know many of you will just do straight in landings from two or three miles out, but we're in a study sim, so why not learn how it was done in real life? It's a lot more rewarding and fun that way. So first, Let's have a look at taking off. You have your engine running on the deck, ready to go, just a few last minute checks. Canopy open. Tailwheel unlocked. Fuel selector to reserve. Trim settings. Rudder 6 degrees right. Elevator 1 degree nose up. Aileron 6 degrees right wing down. This is extremely important. Forgetting your trim settings may cost you your virtual life. Propeller control, maximum RPM. Lower, neutral, all the way forward. Mixture, auto reach. Cow flaps, two third open. Auxiliary fuel pump, on. Hook, up. When it's your turn, taxi forward and line up with the center of the deck. Spread the wings, D handle down to unlock the pins. Wing fold lever forward. Then once the little doors are closed in the wing joints, lock the pins by pulling the D-handle up. Verify the warning horn goes out. Lower your flaps. Depending on your payload, you may use anything up to 50 degrees, but generally 30 degrees will be enough. Lock your tailwheel by pushing the T-handle down. You're ready to go. Throttle up 42 inches while standing on the brakes. Hold the stick all the way back into your lap keep the massive propeller from digging into the wooden flight deck. Careful, with more than 44 inches and the flaps down, the tail will begin to rise even with full aft stick. Let go of the brakes and throttle up to 54 inches of manifold. Push the stick slightly forward to raise the tail as soon as possible. Remember, you have around 30-35 knots of wind over the deck, so the rudder will bite a lot sooner than on land. Some pilots raise the tail before even letting go of the brakes. Keep her straight. Don't hit the island or the gun turrets with your wingtip, then just before reaching the end of the deck, apply a tiny bit of back pressure on the stick. Not too much, you don't want an accelerated stall. If you're heavily loaded, the aircraft may very well settle below the deck level, but don't worry, and especially don't try to fight it by pulling back on the stick. You'll just increase drag and make it worse. Once airborne and you have a positive rate of climb, do a clearing turn to the right and back on course. In case your engine fails, you don't want the ship to run you over. Raise your gear and your flaps, retrim the aircraft and you're good to go. What happens afterwards depends on whether it's a pre-dawn launch or a day launch. On a normal day launch, each carrier in the task group had an assigned rendezvous sector just outside the task group. I'd assume around 10 miles from the flagship at 1000 feet and the strike groups would push at the brief time. Often, these strike groups did so-called pre-dawn launches, 20 to 30 minutes before sunrise in the dark. And in this case, the flight lead would do his clearing turn, then hold the ship's Fox Scorpion flying course, and climb straight ahead to 1,000 feet, allow 20 to 30 seconds for each plane to launch, then he made a two-needle width turn to the left, maintaining altitude until he had turned to the 180 degree reciprocal heading. He was then flying back towards the ship. Each plane would then just climb to 1000 feet, then pick up their flight leader coming back at the same altitude off to their port side. It wasn't easy in the dark. Then each ship had an assigned rendezvous destroyer 20 miles behind the task group and the strike group would orbit overhead at 1000 feet until the brief push time. Each destroyer would show a colored searchlight for recognition purposes. Returning to the carrier had its own procedures. Returning alone, one by one, was frowned upon. It made the job of the radar operators on the ships much more difficult to keep track of all these plots and figure out who's friendly and who's not. So after these strike missions, the strike group would have a rendezvous point 5 to 10 miles from the target and head back together at a brief time. Flying back, they contacted the ship and proceeded to the rendezvous sector of the day. Each day, a 30 degree sector was specified from where you could approach the task group without being taken for an enemy raid. 
You found this sector by listening to the YEZB Morse code. I'll make a separate tutorial on this later. And then you establish the holding 20 miles out until the ship would give you the prep Charlie command when they finished launching the next strike. Then the group proceeded overhead and recovered in a similar fashion as in modern naval ops. Each flight orbited at 1,000 feet altitude blocks overhead the ship, the lowest one coming in for landing when the deck was clear and everyone else shifting 1,000 feet lower in turn. So you set up for the initial, almost like in modern day carrier ops, except you set up at 300 feet instead of 800 and slow down to 120 knots. You go through the landing checklist. Canopy, open. Tailwheel, unlocked. This is different from field ops. As you catch a wire, the tail will swerve. And if the tailwheel touches down a bit sideways, it can break the locking mechanism if locked. Fuel tank selector, on reserve. Mixture, auto rich. Blower to neutral. Propeller, 2300 to 2400 RPM. Cow flaps closed. Electrical auxiliary fuel pump on. Armament switches safe. In a Hellcat or a Tomcat, your hook would also be down at this point, but in the Corsair, you cannot lower the hook before the tailwheel is down. There's an interlock preventing it. Set the course knob on the compass to the ship's Fox Corpin. This will help you find the reciprocal heading when turning downwind. So you fly parallel to the ship's course, slightly off to the right. You verify visually that the deck is clear, ready to receive you. One mile ahead of the ship, you begin a left-hand level turn. You're only 90 knots faster than the ship, so it's gonna take 40 seconds. Keep that in mind. If you're part of a flight, break at a 30 seconds interval. About 30 degrees of bank will put you at the correct beam distance, 1,000 to 1,200 yards. By the way, the Royal Navy broke half a mile ahead of the ship and at a 15 second interval. Their patterns were tighter. During the break, you lower your landing gear, your hook, and drop the flaps to 50 degrees. You need to end up downwind on a reciprocal heading at 150 to 200 feet and slow down to about 100 knots. The key is to find the exact moment when you need to begin your turn on final. Most of you will do this too late, ending up too far behind the carrier, coming in straight. Remember, there is a 30, 35 knots of wind over to the deck and it's pushing you aft. When the leading edge of the left wing touches the stern of the ship, you begin a 30 degree bank left turn, descend to 90 feet and keep it there. Keep the airspeed at 90 knots. Remember, you control the speed with the elevator and the glide slope with the throttle. Careful, if you pull the nose higher than the three point attitude, the Corsair will stall and spin into the water without any warning. Likewise, if you apply power too suddenly, you'll also end up swimming upside down. At the 90, at 90 feet and 90 knots, you pick up paddles, the LSO, the landing signal officer. It's not currently modeled in game, but in my campaign, there will be a rudimentary scripted LSO on screen. You don't even need to look at your altimeter. If you're at 90 feet, the horizon intersects the island just at the bridge. You want to line up with the ship and straighten out just as you cross the fantail, not sooner. Approaching straight, the long nose will block the ship. You won't see anything and it will be extremely difficult to land. The secret to achieve this is to put the left side of the Corsair's nose on the center of the back end of the deck and keep it there. As you cross the fantail just 15 to 20 feet above the deck, you level your wings and when pedals gives you the signal to cut, you cut the throttle. Be ready to apply left rudder to keep the nose straight. At this point, momentarily push the stick forward to dip the nose a bit, then pull it back into your lap to touch down at a three-point attitude and brace for impact. If the hook engages and you come to a stop, immediately raise the hook and taxi forward to clear the landing area. Raise the flaps, fold the wings, open the cowl flaps, and turn up the auxiliary fuel pump. As you taxi past the island, lift up your fingers to show the admiral how many zeros you shut down. He's watching you from Vulture's Row. Follow the taxi directors and park your plane on the bow so the barricade can be raised again and the others behind you can land. Welcome aboard.
Alright, this is how you operate an F4U Corsair from a World War II carrier following real-world procedures. It's not easy, it takes a lot of practice and discipline, but it's very rewarding when done right. I hope you found this video helpful, check out my other tutorials, and don't forget to subscribe. See ya!